If we are going to talk about anatomy and how you function, we certainly need to know one of the primary organ systems in your body, which is your respiratory system. We have to know how you breathe. Before we start, do you remember why you breathe? We talked in cell respiration about what we actually use oxygen for. What is O2 actually used for? Do you remember in cell respiration? We gave oxygen another name. We called it the final electron acceptor. It's critical for the processing of glucose in your body. So if every single cell in your body needs to process glucose into ATP, energy, every cell is going to need oxygen. And if every cell is going to need oxygen to facilitate the breakdown of glucose and the conversion to ATP energy, every cell is going to produce CO2 as waste. We have to deal with this. We have to get oxygen in and we have to get CO2 out. We will look at how this is tied into your digestive system. So how are we going to move things from your stomach that you eat to your cells so that your cells can actually process that input of energy into cellular energy? But that's digestive system. We'll look at how it ties into the cardiovascular system. If we are going to breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide, you aren't one giant lung, so we have to figure out how to move oxygen and carbon dioxide around your body. But first, I want to look at how it actually occurs as far as let's get some oxygen in and get some CO2 out of your body. So gas exchange or respiration or pulmonary ventilation so pulmonary is lungs, so this is the ventilation of your lungs, is this exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Fine. To do this, though, we actually go through three steps in humans and in other animals. The actual breathing itself, so the actual exchange with the environment, Then we look at moving it around the body with blood. We said we'd talk about that in the cardiovascular system later. And then we actually look at an exchange of gases at the body cell level. So this is not at the environment. This is actually at each individual cell exchanging oxygen, carbon dioxide. Because cell respiration must have a continuous supply of oxygen, we have to keep up. So when we look at exchange of our gases at the body cells, what we're really thinking about is the tissues taking up oxygen and giving up CO2 as waste. So all of the systems as far as circulatory system system and respiratory system are going to have to work together, but independent of those systems, every single one of the mitochondria in every single one of your cells is demanding that oxygen. We have to find ways to get it to each and every single mitochondria as efficiently as possible. It means having a lot of surface area, huge amounts of surface area in your respiratory surfaces. So your lungs have a lot of surface area. We also look at the fact that they must be moist. If your lungs are not moist, if your lungs get dried out, it becomes very, very difficult to diffuse oxygen and carbon dioxide. And if you've ever been in a very dry environment, you know that it can be very difficult to breathe as well. And we have to look at respiratory surfaces as being very, very thin. And this is really a diffusion aspect. If you, if you had thick lung tissue, you wouldn't be able to diffuse things through very easily. What if you're an earthworm? Well, there are many organisms that don't have any lungs. They're simply going to exchange, by diffusion, carbon dioxide and oxygen across their skin surfaces. 
it works just fine for them. They're small organisms, but they must be be wet or at least moist most of the time and they've got to be small because if we're looking at exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide just across the skin surface, if you were a large organism like you are, this would never work. You would never get the carbon dioxide out of the middle of yourself and you would never get oxygen to the middle of yourself. There are some animals that have gone a little beyond just breathing across the skin and have added things like gills in fish and amphibians, a tracheal system. So you have a trachea. The trachea in humans is the same as a windpipe. If you run your finger down the front of your neck, you feel bumps or ridges. These are cartilage rings that are part of your trachea or your windpipe. Then we can look at actually adding lungs to all of that trachea and so on. And in you and most amphibians and most reptiles now, we do look at, at a lot of them as having lungs, particularly terrestrial organisms. We'll see that gills are only appropriate if you're an aquatic organism, so if you're living in the water at least most of the time, like our fish here, constant exchange with those gills. They're open to the water. You could look inside this gill slit right here on our fish. If you look inside there, you can see gills. They're open to the outside. They're open to the water. So they're constantly being flushed with water. And you see here that the, the vessels coming into the gills are blue, and the vessels leaving the gills are red. Please don't think that your blood changes color. It does a little bit. It gets darker red or brighter red. It does not become blue, okay? So when we look at these images, the blue indicates low oxygen, high carbon dioxide. It does not mean your blood is actually blue. The red indicates higher oxygen, lower carbon dioxide. Regardless of where you are in your body, your blood is never completely void of oxygen and is never completely void of carbon dioxide. We are constantly exchanging and constantly carrying both. So where you see purple, what do you think that is? Well, it's just a mix of CO2 and O2 rich blood. So as the the fish is swimming, what we look for is the fish to move water across the gills so that we can get good exchange of that blood, good cleaning up of the blood as far as dropping off CO2 and picking up O2. Now the problem is water is not great at holding oxygen. Water holds about 3% of the oxygen that you would find in air. So very, very low oxygen levels. We do see that cold water is better than warm water at holding oxygen. So cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. Fresh water holds more oxygen than salt, salt water, ocean water. And turbulent or white water anything with waves holds more more oxygen than stagnant or very still water. So these are all things to keep in mind. So not only is the fish trying to deal with exchanging lower levels of oxygen than we see in the air, but it also has to deal with other conditions like salt water and temperature and so on. Now compared to water, 
breathing air is much easier in that the oxygen concentrations are higher and air is lighter and easier to move. But the problem is, as we mentioned, we have to deal with the lung surfaces drying out. So we lose a lot of water through those respiratory surfaces. So we have to keep those surfaces moist if you're going to breathe air. In our insects that have a tracheal system such as this, we do see a reduced amount of water loss because the surfaces are smaller. There's good surface area overall, but each individual surface is smaller. And we look at the body cells having a good connection to this tracheal system. You see there are cells immediately surrounding this tracheal system. So there's going to be fairly efficient exchange. But you can imagine that the cells closest to the tracheal system are going to have far better exchange than ones that are in the center, right? So like this big blob here in the center might have less O2, CO2 exchange than we might want or need. And when we talk about them being a tracheal system, it's because they actually look like your trachea. They have bumps, just like I mentioned to you on your windpipe that you can feel in the front of your neck. This cartilage type of ring is, is holding open these tubes so that air can get in and exchanged. O2 comes in, CO2 goes out. Now, these organisms are moving around a lot, which helps them to do better exchange than for us who, Many of us tend to sit all day long, so doing this type of exchange would be very, very difficult and not very efficient. So we have to use lungs, something that's going to allow us to move in large volumes of air and exchange as much as we possibly can of oxygen carbon dioxide through those respiratory surfaces. Now, not all lungs are created equal depending on the complexity of the animal, how much you move around, what your metabolic rates are. Between different species of animals, you'll see different types of lungs and different abilities of the lungs. If we look in our raccoon here, very similar to yours, high respiratory surface area within the lung, so we call these alveoli. We'll come back to those. Compared to your body surface, you do have very large lungs. And the idea is we're going to have to do that oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. Here, this exchange is with the external environment, right? So this is oxygen rich air coming in and CO2 rich air being forced out. So the idea would be over the period of your respiratory inhalation, exhalation, we have to deal with any changes that occur in pressures, in the cell demands, all of these things. We'll talk about that in your respiratory system.